Hey, uh, Laurie, thank you so much for, for joining us um, for, for everyone's benefit. Uh, Laurie recently just finished a book called Sticky, which um, I will kind of like hold up like this and I'll have to fix this in post because I'm one of those heathens that reads ebooks and listens to audiobooks and it doesn't actually buy physical copies. Um, however, I, you know, for everyone that's, that's watching this and is, you know, interested in lubricants and lubrication and, and surface sciences and all this kind of stuff, I can highly recommend it. I thought it was absolutely awesome and basically read the entire book in one day because couldn't put it down. Um, so, Laurie, you know, thanks so much for firstly, like shining a light on what is an often very ignored subject, but secondly, for making it actually interesting and readable. Oh, that's really kind, Rafe. Thank you. Yeah, it it part of my motivation for writing the book was kind of specifically for that reason. I felt like, you know, tribology and surface science and really anything to do with friction were topics that you know, I, I didn't see written about very often in popular science literature. And, you know, my academic, my my research background is roughly kind of touches on the edges of some of that. So, yeah, it was precisely that uh, kind of an underserved area for science communication as far as I saw it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that sort of uh, science communication aspect, that one of the things I found so uh, engaging about the book is um, you did you did tackle some really uh, challenging topics you know <laughs> around uh, adhesion so there was a, there was a a whole chapter about paint and adhesion technologies and uh, the bit of trivia that I got from that one was that oil-based paints do not dry uh, mm -hmm. they, they cure which mm -hmm. you know I had never really thought about but that is very true um, but I think that the question that I wanted to ask you was was around more around like extracting stories um, mm. out of topics so so taking a, a very maybe a, like a nebulous or abstract concept to most people, but yeah. making it concrete through the use of, of really uh, exciting stories. So, you know, part of what you talked about was um, swimming at the Olympics. There was mm -hmm. ball mechanics in sport. There was the, the stickiness of Gecko's feet and all this kind of stuff. It was really, really fascinating. So how do you, how do you find those stories in, in, um, in the science? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And I think possibly my answer is, would be different to say, you know, someone who's been trained as a journalist, their answer might be quite different. I'm, I'm a scientist first and foremost. So usually what motivates me are the ideas. So like you said, I will often start with this kind of big concept or, you know, a big topic that I know I want to talk about. But when I start to kind of, you know, burrow down into it, it usually happens in kind of one of three ways. So one is that I find a really interesting person, right? So that doesn't happen as often as I would like in, in terms of the actual person leading me to an interesting kind of concept or a nugget of an idea in science. Um, but when it does happen, it's just a delight. You know, like you mentioned the swimming at the Olympics. Um, this chapter mostly focuses on these full body swimsuits. These mm. Speedo made the most famous ones, really, that were quite controversial at the time. And I remember reading about the designer of these swimsuits and her name was Fiona Fairhurst. And I thought, if I can get an interview with Fiona Fairhurst, I feel like I'll be able to tell this story properly. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, Speedo's a big company, things are protected by patents. Um, there was a limit as to how much interesting or how interesting the information was that I could find online. And I was like, right, if I can get her, if I can talk to her, then I, I think it could be an interesting story. Mm. And I did, which was great. Yeah. So that happens sometimes. Um, and kind of in a similar way, I will come across a, a paper written by someone and just think that is the perfect person. You know, so I, in, I'm thinking about the touch chapter now in particular. I knew quite early on that I wanted, to, well, that the topic of Braille and how we read mm -hmm. Braille um, that that could be something interesting to explore and, and possibly something a bit unexpected in a book about friction. Um, and I thought what would be amazing would be if I could, you know, interview someone who's a scientist or an engineer who's also themselves visually impaired and to try to understand how you move through the world inside of science and technology while having this visual impairment. So that was kind of an idea I had in my mind. And related to that, I also kind of wanted to do something about tactile technologies, anything to do with kind of tactile technologies. And then I found this person, uh, Professor Sheila O'Moran, who's now at um, Michigan, I think. Um, 
and she she was doing both so she herself is a is a scientist um she's got a background in music um she has done some and is doing some incredible tactile technologies and she herself is blind mm. so she I, again it was like it needed to be her I, I don't want to talk to anyone else it needs to be her um and again i was really lucky and convinced her <laughs> to talk to me too so people people generally are are a real motivator for me you know i think about the people who are doing the work um i also when i interview them i also like to ask them questions like tell me something weird about your research like do you have a question about your science that keeps you awake at night that you can't quite figure out like mm asking a question like that will often uncover something entirely different and will send me off down that path. So I am kind of led by that to a degree. Um, I also read an awful lot of research papers and patents and, you know, technical reports. I have said I'm a scientist. So when I want to understand something, I go to the peer review literature and start looking at it. Um, so often that will lead me either to an interesting person who I then interview or will will identify the kind of unanswered questions within a specific topic, mm. because often the unanswered questions will give you a good story. So they're the kind of they're the kind of main approaches I take. But I you know, this is not I've never been taught how to do this. <laughs> so this is yeah. just literally just me figuring out as I go along, really. Yeah. Well, the, the, the self-taught approach seems to have worked for you. Uh, the, the reason I ask the question is because I think that that's one thing that we in some ways lack in the lubricants community is the, mm. is the capacity to tell really good stories about the, the technology that we, we bring to the market and the value that it, that it brings as well. And this is something mm. that, you know, maybe we'll, talk, we'll get into a little bit later, but sure. um, yeah, there's, there's just, um, we, we need to find a better way of, of telling the story of the technology. And I think you've, you've really tapped into something there. Thank um, you. So I should say though, before we go on, there's so many dead ends as well, Rafe. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, you, you see the successful stories, right? It's very selective <laughs> what you see in the book, but um, yeah, the process of of continuously asking questions, and I try to have quite specific questions in mind. So it will be uh, what what when we see people playing curling, um, what's the sweeping doing? Like, is it just melting the ice? Does it actually make a difference? So they're they're quite tiny little questions, or um, how do we measure friction say between two tectonic plates like how can we understand what's actually going on between two faults so i'm like oh i want to write about earthquakes but then i've got like quite specific questions that i keep asking mm. and asking some of those will often lead me to a dead end but yeah just sometimes it will lead you to uh, something that you can turn into a narrative so it's yeah. it's uh it's a it's a it's a, a whirlwind of an experience yeah, yeah. sometimes yeah the, the, the curling stories were awesome because i i've had you know, being from Australia, the Winter Olympics has always been seen more as a curiosity rather than an yeah. event. <laughs> um, and curling to an Australian is just the most hilarious sport that exists. Yeah. Uh, you know, a combination of lawn bowls and housework. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. And but but somehow you managed to make it fascinating, <laughs> and you know, like the the fact that there are controversies which exist to this day about yeah, you know what's actually going on I, I just thought thought that was really cool but maybe that sort of shoehorns into the next question i wanted to ask mm -hmm. you which was yeah. um what, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about surface science in the, in the course mm -hmm. of researching for this book i think i can probably i think i can probably answer this kind of on two levels um i think a big idea that i I, I had come into the book with an idea that I thought was pretty clear and straightforward, um, but I was completely wrong. So that was kind of a joy. And that was around our understanding of friction. Um, I had this impression that we didn't have a handle on the fundamental nature of friction. Like, where does friction come from when we're talking about a few atoms? You know, we think of it as this big macro scale force or a force that operates across much larger scales but i remember reading years and years ago you know that we don't actually know where friction comes from we don't know what causes it and i thought well that's kind of interesting that's an interesting idea but that's not true at all <laughs> it turns out you know yeah. as we've as we've developed different techniques and, and better microscopes to to probe the nano world and to probe things that are just a few atoms thick um we have really started to develop 
a fairly complicated and fairly sophisticated um, explanation of of where friction comes from. So that was a surprise to me in that it was completely the opposite kind of conclusion that I thought I was going to draw. <laughs> um, and related to that, and perhaps this is something it's incredibly obvious to those who, who listen in and, and watch into your show, but I had not realized that the coefficient of friction is not something that we can predict. So the coefficient of friction mm. between two materials, it's not something that we can take, you know, the fundamental properties of those two materials, everything we know about those two materials on the nanoscale and just use that to predict what the coefficient of friction between them is. Um, you know, like loads of people, I've referred to tables of coefficients of friction in experiments forever, you know, but, but those numbers themselves are approximations. They're best guesses based on many, many experiments. And so rather than having, rather than us not understanding friction at the nanoscale, but being really good at using it on the macro scale, what I realized is that there's a gap. So we do have knowledge down at the atomic scale and we have an incredible amount of knowledge at the macro scale. But what we lack is something that bridges that. We, we lack these kind of a set of models or a set of algorithms that allow us to take what we understand at the nanoscale and use it to help us design better systems um, and probably better lubricants hmm. at the macro scale. So that really surprised me, I have to be honest. Um, yeah, there were some fundamental or some specific ones, like you mentioned the ice. I didn't think that curling was as scientifically controversial as it is. Um, I didn't realize how genuinely fascinating rubber is as a, as a Formula One fan myself. I thought about tires a lot, but not as much as, as I, I should have, perhaps. So, yeah, there were kind of lots of individual ideas that were really surprising to me but the kind of my kind of overall take home idea of of what friction is changed a lot in the process of researching it which which was a joy a surprise and a joy yeah that's really cool it, it's so it's so interesting that when you do get the opportunity to sort of get into the weeds on a subject that there's all these mm. sort of surprising facts which come up and I, I know my own not not deep exploration of of rubber and elastomer materials because you know working as a lubricants engineer you just take it for granted that, that some lubricants are compatible with some elastomers and are not compatible with others. But yeah. Th th it's just in a table and you never question it. You never ask, you sort of never ask why. And I did a video on this channel a little while ago about elastomer compatibility and mm. getting into the chemistry and realizing that the that all of the different elastomers that are built are as chemically complex as the lubricants that we're using and there's additives and there's yeah. you know base materials and all this kind of matrixes yeah and, uh, and you sort of go oh wow like this is this is uh you can really go down the rabbit hole and there's um totally. i'm sure there are people that built their entire careers on you know adjusting one <laughs> small molecule yeah. in in the matrix structure and, and sure making an right. entirely different <laughs> type of rubber right yeah uh, yeah no it was uh, uh fascinating and and the other thing i i thought was interesting um, on that, uh, you know, the predictive capability when you talk about mm. the coefficient of friction. Uh, mm. Of course, uh, Ashley, well, Professor Martini, who was, who was on this podcast, I, I guess the second episode, I mean, that's a yeah. lot of the work that she's trying to get into as well with molecular dynamics and yes. trying to make, you know, trying to en enhance our predictive capability. But, uh, you know, she'd be the first to admit that we're, we're a long way from the, from the final answer. So yeah um, she's amazing she is a, the quality of research that her her group does is just it's just staggering and she and she works across scales which mm -hmm. is very unusual in in most areas of material science you know you tend to focus on your own scale at least if not your own group of materials um but she's doing stuff from like you said from atoms right up to you know really really big industrial processes um so yeah she i was really happy to to find her and to to talk to her for that final chapter of the book and she really helped me understand and, and paint a clearer picture of of that weirdness that we have across scale of friction yeah 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 she's cool yeah yeah definitely there's one um i was going to ask you and this might be a bit of a sort of like a sophie's choice question um <laughs> in that you know did, did you have um, I, I don't want to say like a favorite area of, of mm, research, mm -hmm. but because that, that might be a bit too uh, hard to pick between. But did you feel like any mm. of the areas of research that you, you know, uh, went into, is there any that you felt held a lot of 
promise for the future. Um, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe rather than, you know, necessarily picking one, you can pick a couple. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks. Because <laughs> I probably will have a couple. It, yeah, like you said, it's it's really hard to choose, and you know, it's important to remember as well that I'm seeing this from from my point of view. As yes, I'm a physicist. Yes, I'm a material scientist. Yes, I've done heaps of research, and I know I can pick out you know dodgy looking things in a research paper yeah. better than a lot of scientists, to be honest, at this stage. But um, I think there are definitely like two or three areas that I'm I will be kind of keeping an eye on. In the, in the coming years. Um, one is, we mentioned Professor Ashley, Ashley Martini already, but her research and, and generally research um, around dry lubrication. So mm. trying to look at lubrication again at the nanoscale, um, because if we can better understand the mechanics, they can better understand what is actually happening between atoms and molecules at this scale, in theory, at least, we could start moving away from from oil based lubricants in some in some environments, right? Not in everything we know, but um, I found that really fascinating, and I always love science that's being done to to ask questions about something that's industrially incredibly relevant, but that the fundamentals are still a bit undefined. So that's one area I'm continuing to to keep an eye on in the literature for sure. Um, another one, which is kind of, maybe I'll go in order of uh, how close to market I think they are. Um, the next one is probably, um, there's these kind of uh, coatings that are based on plants, right? So using kind of biomimicry, um, specifically the Salvinia fern, which you know some of your listeners or, or watchers may have, may have heard of before. And it's an invasive weed. You know, normally, it's not a positive thing. You don't really want to have Salvinia anywhere um, because it can form these huge mats that will take over waterways. But it's incredibly good as a water repellent material. Mm. And I... I dove a lot into the details of, of some research that's been done on the Salvinia effect. So probably people have heard of the lotus effect, which is, you know, if you look at the lotus leaf under a microscope, it's covered in these bumps. They're all different sizes. It means the water can't penetrate into the structure and it just rolls off. So that's lovely. But the thing about a lotus leaf is if you leave it under water for long enough, it will lose that ability. It will lose its water mm. repellency. Salvinia fern is different. Um, and what is interesting about it is, in theory, or initially at least, the scientists who are all who are all plant biologists who were looking into this, thought it was the same thing—a kind of a, a waxy, hydrophobic, so water repellent surface um, that was covered in these structures, and in this case, very small hairs. Um, and these hairs actually at the end of the hairs are kind of shaped like a whisk. So kind of four strands. Um, and they were like, yep, it's all covered in wax. It's all hydrophobic. But how does it remain hydrophobic for so long? And it was only fairly recently that they realized that the very tip of this whisk, <laughs> this at the mm. very, very tip of the hair, there's actually a space. They're not, not a space, but there's a gap where there's no wax. So the very tip of these, of this little whisk uh, structure is hydrophilic. So water loving water attracting and what that means is that when you put a piece of salvinia leaf into the water the water actually gets pinned onto the top of these hairs and it traps a layer of air underneath it so it's hydro it's hydrophobicity hydrophilicity combo lets you have a water repellent surface that stays in place for much longer. You can literally put salvinia ferns in water, submerge them in water for years, and it's still, you pull it out and it's, bo it's bone dry. Some of those scientists are starting to develop coatings based on that same idea. And I'm quite excited about that, partly because you know, um, this idea that you could have boats that never get wet. Like mm. I kind of love that as a concept because it's just being cushioned by air. And there are other ways that you can get these air cushions around a boat. But if we consider the fact that like 90% of the world's trade is done by sea, if we could have boats that could move through the water with less friction, it would cut down hugely on fuel costs mm. and, and the environmental costs of that fuel. So that's something I'm super excited about and I hope kind of continues to develop and um, things are being patented etc it's moving but who knows um the final one is probably kind of gecko inspired grippers they're really already in the market in in some sectors um 
they don't perfectly mimic a gecko foot. Uh, we don't have the ability to produce such fine features that the gecko has evolved. Um, but it takes inspiration from it in that um, they use a, a silicone rubber um, and it's covered in very, very tiny wedges. It's kind of been etched to cover it in tiny wedges. And um, when you put those that that kind of uh, silicone rubber um, wedge material against a surface and drag it along, it splays the wedges out and it starts to tap into what we call van der Waals attraction. So it starts to take notice of the electrons in whatever item you're trying to pick up or move. Um, the gecko kind of goes many, many steps beyond that in terms of complexity. Uh, but you can get a lot of the same performance just from this this wedge, these wedges of silicone. And now we're starting to see them being put on um, things that look like hands or grippers where they have a kind of finger with gecko gecko uh, tape on it. And they are really, really brilliant at picking up awkwardly shaped things or fragile things. So tested in the space industry, being used and, and continuously kind of updated in the space industry, but also being used on the factory floor in some cases where you're having to pick up awkward things um, and to do so reliably uh, without needing things like loads of extra, you know, high pressure air or, or you know, making permanent bonds where you're using proper adhesives. This is just as useful as, as your hand, except your hand also ends up being having a grippiness that you can turn on and off. So that's one that I think is kind of, it's already on the way, but I think we're going to see a lot more of it. So they're probably my, they're probably my top three, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That's so, yeah, that's so interesting, especially when you talk about the, the, the gecko's hand, one of the features mm. of your book, which I, I really related to was um, actually breaking, breaking sort of like uh, macro uh, phenomena down mm. to the atomic scale to say, well, what kind of forces are actually involved? And like you said, with the gecko's foot, it's pr predominantly Van der Waals attraction, which is, you know, a, a kind of a scientific concept that we probably all learn about in high school yeah, and have never really applied to our understanding of a lot of the technologies that we use yeah. now. And so, you know, one, one thing on this channel that we, um, I'm trying to do is, is, is do that kind of thing to explain mm. things like viscosity and the, the attraction or why, why certain molecules with different polarity will solvate yeah. or will not. But yeah, so breaking it down into its you know, it's, it's fundamental forces, if you like, is yeah. um, you, you did it much better than, than, than I do in, in making, <laughs> I <don't it>, know. <laughs> making it so understandable, even when it was just, uh, you know, text based. And uh, I, I found that um, a really, really cool part of the book. But um, with, uh, especially with the idea of uh, reducing the drag on mm -hmm. uh the marine fleet, the global marine yeah. freight fleet, right? Yeah. Um, which I thought was just a, a really fascinating part of the book as well. But that link between uh, surface science and sustainability, um, historically, I feel like uh, our industry, and, and when I say our, I'm, I'm talking specific, specifically about lubricants and greases, um, but you could apply it generally to surface science. Historically, I feel like we haven't done a very good job of mm. communicating mm. the value that we can bring, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a sustainability standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you referenced, what is it, the 2016, 2017 paper um, that it's something like a quarter of all the world's energy just goes into friction and it's yeah. just wasted. Yeah. You know, so the surface sciences have a lot of value uh, to potentially bring. Mm -hmm, but again, mm -hmm. I don't think we've done a very good job of communicating that. So do you have any tips <laughs> for the industry? I suspect I'd be a multimillionaire if I did. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think so. We've kind of, I, I, I've heard you ask this or a similar question to some of your other guests and, and it kind of put me in mind of, of what my answer would be if we were to ever do this chat. Um, and the first thing that came into my head is, so I'm, I'm a metrologist by training, so I'm a measurement scientist by training. And metrology is one of these, another one of these areas of science that is so fundamental, especially to kind of industrial, the industrial world. Mm -hmm. um, it's so fundamental that it's just completely ignored. Yeah. It's baked, you know, it's baked into so many processes that we, that 
other than metrologists, most people will never think about yeah. how you can measure the second or or why the kilogram is the way that it is, or yeah. you know all of these things. Um, and that that has always been a communication challenge for metrology. You know, it's trying to say this is really important and really relevant, and you should be really interested in it because it's so important. Um, and I think that the lubrication industry has a similar challenge. Mm. Um, because I think that most people have absolutely no idea how many lubricants they interact with on a daily basis. None, like none. I would kind of love, I have this idea that maybe I shouldn't say this, but I have this idea that, you know, we would be able to talk about, you'd be able to take someone through a day in their life, um, to think about the lubricants that they would interact with or that their technology that they're using relies on. Um, and I, that's, that's the big challenge, right? It's this. It's ubiquitous, but it's invisible. So that invisibility is is a challenge. Um, I think the lubrication industry has another level of problem, though. <laughs> it's like a quite a unique challenge for lubrication, and that's that there are huge benefits, like you said, to lubricating contacts. Um, there are huge amounts of energy that we could be saving if we use the correct lubricants. But the other side of that is that it's it's linked to the oil industry, um, and there's no getting away from it, you know, and, and I think people are skeptical of the oil industry and that is for good reason, you know, with all due respect, it's been, yeah. it's been an industry that we have seen, uh, cause huge amounts of damage, but of course, you know, we're the ones using the products, right? So it's not entirely the oil industry, but, and also not taking responsibility for it. And I think that if you want to have a, a, a proper conversation about lubrication to the in, to the wider community, communities really, because um, there's always more than one, um, you have to be really honest about that. And you have to really respect the fact that your audience, if they know enough to know how important lubrication is, they probably know that it's, it's all the big oil companies who make mm. most of the, most of the product. So, yeah. My advice in that regard is probably don't pretend otherwise. Um, I think people get a bit sick of, well, you know, we hear about green, we hear greenwashing as a term a lot. Um, and I think people are very alert to it. So I would probably um, be really honest about that and say, yeah, it is. This is a product of the, of the oil industry. We're not pretending that it's not. Um, however, there are enormous benefits to it and we can save, you know, X amount of energy compared to other technologies that can harvest, you know, this percentage of the energy in, in a system. Um, and I, cause I've seen a lot of kind of comms uh, around lubrication that only focuses, and I can understand why on renewable energies. So the use of lubricants in, in EVs or the use of lubricants in yep. wind turbines. Um, but people just get cynical about that because they're just like, yeah, but what about all the other, <laughs> what about all the other stuff? Um, so yeah, I guess one piece of advice is, is be prepared for that. Mm. Um, when you sh shine a light on something really positive, you will also get, you'll have to deal with the negative stuff. Um, it's, it's not meant to put you off. It's just mm. to be totally honest. Um, I think also to remember who your audience is. Like you mentioned this, you know, before that you have people who are all speaking different languages, effectively, all technical people, but we will use different languages, um, different words and different terms to mean the same thing sometimes. So always remembering who your audience is and tuning your message for that audience is a, is a key thing. But I think initially it's it's kind of a visibility issue. It is at this at the at this point like this, but stuff like you're doing, like this this show that you're doing, and and other outputs, that is a big part of this. Um, showing the people who are working in that sector and what they do in their areas of expertise, that's a huge part of it. Um, but yeah, it is it is a I think it is a particularly challenging industry to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's careful. an interesting point that you raised because, you know, mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges historically as well, and this is just from, uh, you, know, you, you, you talk about the outside attention, but I think mm. even within oil companies, uh, the lubricants, uh, let's say division, if you want to yeah. call that the business line mm -hmm. or business unit, I'm yeah. sure every company has its own terminology, but it, even then it struggles for attention internally too, because, mm, you know, for, for most of those companies, I think, um, 
you know, they definitely, they usually talk about F and L. So it's fuels and lubricants is usually considered one division. And who's, right. who's the money spinner in that relationship, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's the fuels guys because the volumes are just, you know, several orders of magnitude larger than, than lubricants. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so I think like even internally trying to get that message out, like, mm. you know, or, you know, marketing as, as you would know, it, it costs money and it requires oh, investment. Yeah, sure. Well, all mm. that money goes to the fuels business, right? Cause it's, mm-hmm. it's so much easier to, to advertise and get people to pull up at a petrol station and, and fill up. And that's mm. what, that's what pays the bills. So I think in some ways there's also an internal problem of how, do, yeah. how does the lubricants, uh, yeah, business line get more attention um, mm. and enable them to, to sort of get their message out as well. And I think um, that's, yeah. that's sort of part of the problem, right? When they've got limited mm-hmm. funds, mm-hmm. yeah, they, they try and focus on that, the, the renewable stuff. And like you said, mm-hmm. you know, greenwashing, and, and I think people mm-hmm. see through that yeah, uh, uh, very, very easily. So, mm. um, yeah, how do you, how do you um, get that message out? And I, I do think that there are, you know, there are, let's say, lubricant specialist companies. So, you know, there are a few of yep. them that aren't integrated oil and gas companies and just specialize in lubricant technologies. I think, I feel like they have a much easier time of it because they, they only have to talk about that one narrow focus. I think that's very true. Yeah, I think they do. Because even though they're still using the same products yeah. <laughs> as, as the oil companies, um, it is easier for them to have, you know, plausible deniability, I suppose. Yeah, um, you're sort of not attached yeah. to the, like the rest of the baggage yeah. that the, the, the industry carries. And, and like you said, you, mm-hmm. can't, you can't shy away from that stuff either. No, uh, it, it is difficult. And I think, I mean, one of the things that I always, and I, I remember doing this, thinking about metrology, it would be trying to imagine is it what, what a situation would be like if we didn't have metrology. You know, what mm. would it be? What would be like shopping in the supermarket be like if we didn't have the ability to measure things accurately? And, and you know, it includes stuff like the time on your till receipt would be incorrect because it wouldn't be measured accurately enough to the obvious stuff like, you know, the weight of your vegetables that you've bought. Yeah. So you know or anything like that there's so much of that but i think sometimes imagining what it would be like if we didn't have it can often lead you to interesting ways to engage people mm-hmm. in in what it means to have these products um or to have this area of research or, or to have this research being done you know um yeah i think sometimes you have to like flip the script on it a little bit especially in a topic that people don't necessarily have an instinctive understanding mm-hmm. of who may never have interacted or at least not consciously interacted with with these types of products you know they, they're the people who send their car to the mechanic and the mechanic sorts it out and they don't worry yeah. about it you know for those people lubrication is just too far away from anything useful mm. so i think sometimes repackaging it so you think well what if i didn't have it what if these products didn't exist what if and I think like you become very aware of like friction in particular um, when you don't have any of it. <laughs> so when you're sliding on ice, you're just like, whoa, friction is important, man. Um, you know, and I think sometimes you, you have to play that um, the opposites, the opposites kind of role. Like what would happen if we don't have it and what can we do now that we do have it? And yeah. what are, what could we do in the future if we better understood the mechanics you know the mechanisms behind um these processes maybe we could do away maybe we could put ourselves out of business if we could understand yeah. you know um this if we you know and it's just it's kind of i think sometimes being brave and asking yourself tricky questions can often lead you to interesting stories and better ways to engage with whichever of your audiences you're trying to tackle yeah. i think well that almost feels like we've come we've come full circle about <laughs> you know asking really good questions so that that sort of feels like a, a really good place to end it um you know laurie th- thanks so much for your time i know you're very busy um also you know congratulations on the book too i know it's progressively getting released in like, different countries <laughs> as we as we go um yeah. so hopefully wherever you are in the world listening at the moment it will be available i'll try yep. and put a link maybe down to like an Amazon cool. link or something Thank down below um, where it's available. Um, uh, like I said, it, the book is called Sticky uh, by Laura Winkless. It's uh, one of the best reads uh, that I've had uh, for the last couple of years and uh, highly recommend it to anyone in this community. So uh, pick up a copy and um, yeah, go read it. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Rafe. It was really awesome talking to you. Um, thanks for having me on. All right.
easy as pie. That was super.